you know my name, for you have whispered it in fear for centuries, mindful of the horrors I carved upon history itself. Vlad III, Dracula, son of the dragon, and I will have my throne. My nation will be free at any cost, and I will bow the knee to no man, Hungarian or Turk, emperor or sultan. My story begins with my father, an ambitious man who fought for many years to take his rightful place as the ruler of Wakalia, a nation in what is today southern Romania. Stuck between the Kingdom of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, our nation was frequently nothing more than a political tool to be wielded by one side against the other. After having to flee from Hungarian forces, Sultan Mehmed II granted my father the support of a small army with which to retake the Wakalian throne. There was but one condition. Myself and my brother Radu would be left behind as royal hostages, and my father was to pay yearly tribute to the Ottomans, swearing fealty to their rule. With their aid, my father retook the throne, and once more my family ruled, albeit over a land with no true independence beholden to powers far greater than itself. Predictably, my father would go on to betray the Turks in 1444, when the European powers gathered together to try to stop the Ottoman Empire's expansion into Central Europe. Despite some initial successes, unfortunately for my father, he was inevitably forced into a peace with the greater power. And sick of my father's double-crossing, Lord Hyundai at last invaded Wakalia, chasing my father from the throne and killing him. My eldest brother, Myceria II, was with my father in the end, and the boyars, rich noblemen of my country, captured the two and put out his eyes with red-hot pokers before burying him alive. I would not quickly forget their hideous violence against my kin, but like my father, I too would have to bide my time. Surprising perhaps most of all to myself, the Sultan did not immediately order Adu and I's deaths after my father's betrayal. The Sultan was always thinking ahead, and saw no use for the murder of the only two legitimate heirs to the Wakalian throne. Instead, he continued to keep us safe in his care, until fate turned in his and my favor. Lord John Hyundai, backed by various European powers, launched once more into a campaign against the Ottoman Empire in 1448 taking with him the imposter king he had placed upon the Wakalian throne, Vladislav II. With Vladislav II, Sultan Mehmed granted me an army with which to re-enter my home and take the throne. Shortly after my return, however, the Ottomans scored a decisive victory against Hyundai's army, albeit at a great cost. The forces lent to me by the Sultan returned to their homes, and with the failure of Hyundai's crusade, I learned that Vladislav II now marched upon Wakalia. A king is no king without an army to defend his right to rule. And sadly, I found myself without said army. Forced to abdicate my rightful throne, I fled into exile, vowing to return and reclaim what was my birthright. For long years, I bowed my time in my exile to the only place friendly to my interests, the Ottoman Empire. I found myself still in favor with the Sultan, though I rankled at the knowledge that to the lecherous old ruler, I was nothing more than a pawn, and my kingdom and my homeland merely pieces of a greater puzzle in the Sultan's ambitions for Europe. My father's death and my own young life had taught me the virtue of patience, however, and patiently I waited, knowing that the ever-evolving conflict between Europe and the Ottoman Empire, between Christianity and Islam, would eventually present an opportunity to return home. That opportunity came in 1456. Vladislav II was no longer as politically useful to the Hungarian Empire as he had been, and Lord Hyundai offered me a chance to reclaim my throne on the condition that I'd remain faithful to Hungary in future conflicts. You may judge me and my father as you wish, but know that I am a loyal man, loyal to my soldiers, my kin, and to my people. But I refuse to be the pawn of greater powers, and my ultimate ambition 
was always to free my home from the influence of the two kingdoms it found itself between. I swore my fealty to Hungary, knowing even as I took that oath that I would one day break it. With the support of the Empire, I re-entered my homeland for a second time in 1456 and demanded that the impostor King Vladislav II face me in single combat. A king who does not appear great, godlike even, before his people is not long to rule, and despite my obvious physical superiority in weapons training and youth both, the fool agreed to face me rather than hide behind his army, as he and I both knew he must. We matched blades surrounded by a circle of soldiers and boyars alike. Vladislav was a formidable man once, but age had dulled his reflexes, sapped his speed, and strength both. I toyed with the fool, my blade repeatedly finding exposed flesh, his blood trampled into the mud underfoot. Cut in a dozen places, the pretender king refused to surrender, and I could see by now, in the eyes of the boyars gathered, a silent pleading for mercy. Put the fool out of his misery, I could see their eyes saying, enough is enough. They had their fill of blood, it seemed. A pity, for I would drown many of them in the deluge of crimson in the weeks and months to come. With a single thrust, I slew the imposter and reclaimed my throne. Patience, as I mentioned, is a hard-earned virtue, and at last it would pay dividends. With my throne secure, I immediately turned upon the wealthy boyars, the very men who years ago had betrayed and murdered my father plucked the eyes from my eldest brother and buried him alive. My wrath was immediate, and I put into practice a technique I had learned during my long years of captivity in the Sultan's court. A greased log, sharpened on one end, would be laid on the ground, with the victim made to sit upon the pointed tip and held fast with the use of ropes attached to each leg. The victim and log would then be lifted into the air, the body's weight impaling the victim upon the sharpened stake from below. I watched with no small satisfaction as the men who had murdered my father were each in turn forced to watch the impalement of their wives and children before meeting the fate themselves. Next, I turned this favored punishment of mine onto the ranks of betrayers lurking amongst the psychopaths of my court. Other wealthy noblemen I knew or suspected of plotting behind my back. I would have my kingdom, and I would have it be free of traitorous rats. During my life, I have held no great love for the Turks or the Sultan, and yet I am no fool. Upon retaking my throne, I began the customary yearly tribute to the Ottomans, a move which angered my Hungarian beneficiaries. Yet this tribute would be cut off just years later. My people would not be subject to any foreign power, Hungarian or Ottoman. I knew my move would bring conflict, and I had long ago prepared for a coming war. Using my intimate knowledge of the Ottoman Empire and its forces, I launched a series of lightning raids across the border and into Turkish lands, destroying many key provincial outposts and fortresses that could be used to support an invasion into Wakalia. I took plunder as well, righteous repayant for my years of forced tribute to the Sultan. As I knew would happen, the Ottomans responded in force, and in 1462, an army 150,000 strong marched against me. I had no hope of defeating this larger force in direct conflict, and so I turned the very land of my nation and its people against the invaders. My forces fought a retreating action, forcing the Turks to push even deeper into my lands to secure a decisive victory. Yet as I steadily retreated, I poisoned wells, breached levees, and flooded marshlands, even ordering the evacuation of all people and animals in the path of the Turkish forces. The Sultan and his men would find no crumb or morsel amongst my lands to feed their rumbling bellies, and with supply lines stretched to the breaking point, fatigue settled in. I spread illness amongst their ranks as well, rounding up hordes of lepers, men and women with tuberculosis and other virulent plagues, and marched them directly into the ranks of the invaders. I could not retreat forever though, and late one night, I launched a daring raid into the Sultan's camp itself, 
though sadly slew instead two grand viziers and not the head of the snake as I had planned. My forces could not stand against the superior Turks for much longer, even half-starved and beset with all manner of virulence as they were. I would send these invaders a message then, a final warning to leave my lands and never return, on pain of greatest torture. Weeks later, my masterpiece would be revealed to the invaders as they entered the now deserted town of Tagroviste. There, in a field 2600 meters long and 1100 meters wide, lay 20,000 souls upon sharpened stakes. Turkish prisoners and civilians both, the great slaughter on full display held row upon row of families strung up together, infants pierced along with their mothers. By the time the Turks found them, the birds had made nest in their entrails. As I have said before, I would see my home free of both Turks and Hungarians at any cost. Filled with horror, the Sultan ordered his grand army to retreat, but left a force at the border held it by my youngest brother Radu, now turned traitor against his own kin. Born of a gentler persuasion and a natural charisma, Radu managed to do what I could not and turn public support against me and my rule, not with threats of violence and grisly displays of torture, but with kind words and promises of solidarity and forgiveness for past transgressions against my family. Radu, the youngest brother I had protected as best as I could for years during our captivity, would now be my undoing as I lost the support of my people and was once more chased into exile. The value of royal blood has always been greater than gold, for it can buy more readily that which coin often cannot. Political stability. I was captured by the Hungarians who imprisoned me as an insurance policy, and once more I found myself biding my time, knowing that in the end, I and only I would be the one to decide my fate and that of my people. In the meantime, I entertained myself with an old hobby and took great delight in the horror of my guards as they discovered the rows of impaled mice and robins which I had lured into my cell. In 1476, nearly 50 years of age, I was released from my prison and once more on the march to reclaim my throne, supported by Hungary. Age and imprisonment had robbed me of youthful vigor and strength, yet I took to the field of battle regardless. I suppose I knew the fight would likely be my last, but I would be the one to write my own ending for the histories, and not the Hungarians or the Turks. Late in 1476, I fell, sword in hand, never to rise again. Yet though my kingdom had eluded me a third time, I had won the greater prize in the end, my name written in the annals of history forevermore. My name is Vlad II Dracul, the son of the dragon, and you know my name, for you whisper yet in fear, centuries after my death, mindful of the horrors I inflicted upon my enemies. <laughs> Ha 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 